Welcome back to the next video, everybody. I decided to move on to chapter four today. The stuff I had to say at the end of chapter three just wasn't important enough to bring to your attention. So we're going to start chapter four of my notes, which is on Galois cohomology groups. So today we're just going to look at the zeroth and second groups. So first of all, references. Throughout the entirety of this chapter, you might want to have SARE local fields available. I'll call that SLF. SARE Galois cohomology, SGC. MCF, that's Milne's class field theory notes. CSS chapter four is, is the main driver behind these notes. So that's Cornell, Silverman, Stevens. And Milne's arithmetic duality theorems, which I'll call MAD, especially chapter one. And then various other standard sources containing expositions on the topic of group cohomology and Galois cohomology. There's all kinds of survey papers out there and Conrad probably has some stuff. Okay, and then the setup here is just, we'll let K be a field with separable closure K bar. We'll let G sub K be its absolute Galois group. For a prime P, we'll let G sub P be the local Galois group G sub Q sub P. And we'll let I sub P and G sub P be the inertia group at P. As usual, all this stuff was defined in videos very early on in the series. Okay, so what's the zero with Galois cohomology group? Let's let G be a group. And let's let X be an abelian group on which G acts in the usual sense. We'll call such an X a G module, okay? If our groups are topologized, we're gonna assume the action is continuous, but this is mostly ignored. It's kind of floating around in the background. We won't really acknowledge it much. Okay, the zero with cohomology group H zero of GX, of, or relative to G and X, let's say, is just defined to be X to the G. It's the stuff in X fixed by G. So it's the set of all X and X such that G of X equals X for all G and G. So it's the stuff in X fixed by everything in G. So some examples, uh, G sub K acts on K bar across or K bar star, if you like, the non-zero elements of K bar. And H sub zero of GK, K bar star is just K star. This is one of the central tenets of Galois theory. Let mu sub N denote the group of nth roots of unity. Then H zero of GQ acting on mu N is plus or minus one if two divides N and one if two doesn't divide it. Okay, what's going on here is that the absolute Galois group of Q certainly acts on the nth roots of unity. And that action only fixes the root of unity one if N is odd, but it will fix negative one as well if N is even because it will send negative one to an odd power of itself by necessity. Okay. Okay, occasionally, like if G is finite, we may not wanna work just with H zero GX, we might want to work with what's called the, the zero with Tate cohomology group, which is like H hat zero GX. And it's not just X to the G, it's X to the G mod norm of X, we'll, we'll call it, where norm of X is the sum over G and G of all the GXs. And here we're thinking of X as additive or else this doesn't really make sense. Okay, so norm of big X is just the set of all the norm of little X's. Okay, so example, this is an easy example. If X is abelian of odd order and it's acted on by the Galois group of C over R, then the norm of X obviously contains X to the G, right? That's clear. And so, well, it may be an easier way to see that is it contains two X to the G, but two X to the G is just X to the G. You can work all this out easily. And so, well, what, what will happen then? What's the zero with the cohomology? Well, it's just zero because if X to the G is just contained in norm X, then when I mod out by norm X, I have nothing left. Right? So I get zero with, I get trivial zero with Tate cohomology group in this example. Okay, let's move on to the second Galois cohomology group. We'll do the first one later. Let's define H2 of GX to be two co-cycles mod two co-boundaries. What the heck does that mean? A two co-cycle is a map of sets F from G cross G to X, such that what we'll call Delta F, which is F of G1 comma G2 G3, minus F of G1, G2, comma, G3, plus G1 times F of G2, comma, G3, minus F of G1, comma, G2. If all that, which we'll call delta F, is zero, then F is called a two co-cycle. And we're gonna say F is a two co-boundary if there exists a map H from G to X, such that F of G1, G2 is G1 times H of G2, minus H of G1, G2, plus H of G1. We'll call this whole thing here delta H, if there is such a map H corresponding to F such that F of G1 and G2 is Delta H, then we're gonna say F is a two co-boundary. Now these are, in my opinion, these are terrible definitions. I will give you, even, even though these are the much, even though these are the standard sort of technical definitions you wanna be aware of for computations, there are much more intuitive definitions for co-cycles and co-boundaries, which I'll give in a later video. So H2 of GX is just two co-cycles mod two co-boundaries, okay? 
Okay, so let's look at an example. Let's let P be prime and let's let G equal G sub P, the local Galois group at P. Let's let A and B be in QP cross or QP star if you like. And let's assume A is not a square. Let's define F of G1, G2 to be B. If G1 root A is negative root A and G2 root A is negative root A and one otherwise, okay? And so it's easy to check then that F as a map from GP cross GP to QP star is a co-cycle. And so it will yield, if you just take its class, an element of the second cohomology group H2 of GP QP star. If B is a norm from QP root A, so if B is, if B in QP star is the norm of an element in, in the field extension QP adjoin root A, which in this case just means B is X squared minus AY squared for some X, Y, and QP. Then if we let H of G be X plus Y root A, if G root A is negative root A, and, it lets, and if we let H of G equals one otherwise, you can check, it's just a calculation, that F of G1, G2 is G1 times H of G2 times H of G1 over H of G1, G2. And so the element you obtain in H2 is trivial because the co-boundary condition is satisfied. So your, your class is trivial because your class, remember H2 is co-cycles mod co-boundaries. Okay, well, your co-cycle that you get in the case B is a norm from QP adjoin root A is already a co-boundary. And so its class in H2 is trivial. It also turns out if the element of H2 obtained in this way is trivial, then B must have been a norm from QP adjoin root A. So the converse is true as well. And so what's really going on here is you can recall the Hilbert symbol, um, AB sub P we'll call it, which equals one if B is a norm from QP adjoin root A and negative one otherwise. That's really what's going on here. The cohomology class we obtained above is really effectively just the Hilbert symbol, close, very, very closely related uh, to the Hilbert symbol. And a standard property of the Hilbert symbol is that APB equals one if and only if X1 squared minus AX2 squared minus BX3 squared plus ABX4 squared equals zero has a non-zero solution in QP. So it's a very strong and powerful tool in the study of quadratic forms. And this, by the way, happens if and only if the quaternion algebra QP uh, join IJK with I squared equals A, J squared equals B, K squared equals negative B, negative AB, sorry. And then IJ equals K, JK equals I, and so on, all the rotating conditions on IJK is isomorphic to the algebra of two by two matrices over QP. So M22 QP. And if you, if you don't know the alternative, like if you're not isomorphic to this algebra of matrices, then you're isomorphic to some division algebra. Okay, so you should see Sarah, of course, in arithmetic chapter three for far more information on quadratic forms, on the Hilbert symbol, on all of this, how you would use it. Okay. But for us, it's just serving as kind of a basic uh, example for Galois cohomology and looking at that second Galois cohomology group. Okay, we'll finish with uh, two examples and a proposition. So H2 of GK K bar star is known as the Brouwer group of K. And what it does is it classifies central simple K algebras. I won't define any of that terminology. It's a bit tangential for our purposes, but you can go check all that out. This is true for any field K. And pro so proposition one, let P be a prime. Then H2 of GP QP bar star is isomorphic to Q mod Z. This is a very important result in class field theory and in Galois cohomology. It is basically a special case of well, where we can actually calculate the Brouwer group, although we can calculate the Brouwer group in a lot of different cases. Um, I would just see Milne's class field theory notes for a proof of this and for a large discussion in of Brouwer groups and computations, specific computations of other Brouwer groups. Okay, example, in our example above that we just got done discussing with the Hilbert symbol, the cohomology class of F is zero if APB equals one, we talked about that explicitly. And it's one half mod Z otherwise, because it's uh, of order two and the second cohomology group is isomorphic to Q mod Z. So it must be one half mod Z. Okay, so we'll push on and we'll talk about the first cohomology group next video. So thanks for watching and I'll see you then.